This is Gilded Age Part 2. Today we're going to be going into the Gilded Age once again, which, just a reminder that that is about the time period where things were going really good on the outside, but on the inside things uh, were a little rough on the people that were actually doing all the work. Today we're going to start talking about the business people of the Gilded Age, the people that um, were basically the richest people in America at this time and the people that really got things moving in America, some good, some bad. The first guy we're going to talk about is Andrew Carnegie or Carnegie, depending on where you're from. Um, he was known for steel. Um, he was uh, from Scotland when uh, he was a uh, immigrant when he came over he worked for a dollar twenty five per week and it's a great rags to riches story because by nineteen hundred he had a personal income of twenty five million a year he was uh... basically made most of his money on steel and the steel that he provided fueled the growth of our cities in skyscrapers he first made his millions um, with the steel building the railroads but there can only be so many railroads so he expanded it perfected the steel making industry and eventually he's going to make millions and millions and millions of dollars by helping providing the steel to build the skyscrapers in the big cities New York and Chicago um, he will eventually sell his, his business to a man named J.P. Morgan, who we'll talk about later, for $460 million. So this is a guy that came over off the boat from Scotland and uh, sold his company, Carnegie Steel, to J.P. Morgan for $460 million. That's an amazing rags-to-riches story. Um, if you've ever been to Pittsburgh, if you've ever been to Pennsylvania, you'll see his name all over the place, including in New York, Carnegie Hall. Um, as we said, he uh, also wrote a book called The Gospel of Wealth, which uh, said basically it was, a it was a sin to die rich. And so he was very generous with his money, gave a lot of money to charity and uh, lots of libraries, Carnegie Mellon. College is like one of the most prestigious colleges in the country and in the world. So you'll see his name on a lot of those things like that. J.P. Morgan bought, you know, he, we just mentioned him, um, was known for railroads, banking, steel. Um, he will actually form out of Carnegie Steel when he bought that for 460 million dollars he will form a company called US Steel which is still in existence today it became the first billion dollar business US Steel will be the first billion dollar business um, he was very good at mergers okay and there's two types of mergers so this is important make sure you write this down there's a vertical merger and this is where you're buying a business to expand your own okay and that that business that you buy will stay in business and that's a very common thing you may have a a business where let's say you're making a toilet paper so you need to find a find a better way to ship so you buy a shipping company okay that's a way that you will expand your own business so that is a vertical merger a vertical merger. Now, a more controversial merger is called a horizontal merger, and uh, the Justice Department doesn't look too favorable on this because this is also steps to forming a monopoly, which, as we know, is illegal in our country, and that is called a horizontal merger. A horizontal merger. And this is where you'll buy out a competitor, and that company will no longer exist. Um. An example of that back in the Blockbuster days, which is dying out as we know, Blockbuster bought all the, the video towns uh, around and just closed them down, and they're the only competitor there. Um, there's some other examples I'm sure that you could think of 
in your in your own time, but uh, it's when you buy out a company and that company will no longer exist, and you're basically just buying out a competitor. So you're getting rid of the competition. That is called a horizontal merger. Make sure you know the those, okay? And that's what J.P. Morgan was very good at. He was very good at buying companies and uh, flipping them, making them better, or just knocking out the competition. So he was very good at uh, at those mergers, and that was what he was most known for. J.D. Rockefeller, he was the owner of Standard Oil. Standard Oil. Um, once again, a self-made man. Um, he had the largest oil company in the world, and uh, it would eventually be broken up. Okay, When I was growing up, BP, for instance, was part of this. It used to be called Sohio, S-Ohio. And uh, that was actually, they had to break those companies up because Standard Oil was so big, it actually had to fight an antitrust or a monopoly lawsuit. And one of their ways of, of dealing with that is they broke the company up into smaller companies. So you'd see a Ohio or um, other places in, in Indiana um, and uh, Texas, Sunoco, and, and places like that. So... Major oil company standard that's still in, in existence today. The next guy, Cornelius Vanderbilt, railroad and shipping. Okay, he was known for this. Vanderbilt College in uh, Tennessee. Um, he made his millions on building the railroads in the South. And uh, very, very important man as far as shipping in the shipping industry. Sorry. And then this last man, not a rich man like those other gentlemen that we talked about, but he actually will write about these men. His name is Horatio Alger. He wrote these short stories, and they called them dime novels because you can probably guess how much they cost, a dime. He wrote these because they were rags to riches stories. They had the message that if you work hard and, and have a good life, you, a clean living, that you can be successful too and just look at these gentlemen you know Carnegie an immigrant to um, a billionaire I mean just those stories are are just in, impressive so that's where he is going to help spread the word and you know today spread the American dream so that is Horatio Alger oops I messed up here so The next thing that we will do is the mass production piece of all this. Um, you know, we start mass producing things, okay? And, and really, at this point in this, the second industrial revolution, as we're going to come to call this, this is the, the time after the Civil War, we, we were beginning to mass produce about everything. Okay, our patents exploded during this time, and uh, the patents from seven. Just an example. You don't need to write this down, but 1790 to 1860, there were 36,000 patents granted in the U.S. Uh, patents are, you know, your ideas, your inventions. 1861 to 1890, there were 440,000 patents granted. So you can see how things were were just exploding. By 1900, we will overtake Britain in production, and we'll never look back. 1913, we account, we'll, we'll account for one-third of the world's manufacturing. That's just amazing. So now that we are mass-producing these things, we want to expand our markets. We want to get these ideas out. So we start to see distribution specialists, okay? And... In 1871, we'll see Montgomery Ward. Okay, he comes up with the mail order catalog. Now, we don't have catalogs anymore like we used to. They're still out there. You have to go on the Internet to ask for them because they're expensive to produce. But Montgomery Ward um, uses the postal system, which was much improved at this point. And uh, basically, he, his belief was if you can't come in the stores, the stores are going to go to the people. 
and they'll build the first catalog. You know, today most of us do our shopping online, but back then it was a lot of catalogs. And here I got little Rudolph here. Everybody knows the little story of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Well, Montgomery Ward actually creates the story of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and uses it to sell his catalogs. So that's where good old Rudy comes from. So that's why I have that on there. Plus I like Rudolph. Now the next two gentlemen, Sears and Roebuck. <clears throat> I'm sure you've heard of them. Richard Sears and Alvin Roebuck and another gentleman named James Cash Penny or J.C. Penny. These stores are still in existence today. They will build um, they'll print the first color catalogs okay and here is a picture of one of the first catalogs 1897 um, once again they build trust with the customers people enjoy shopping in this manner uh, factories allowed for mass production um, but uh, you know they, they need a better way to get the the word out to the people okay you know, at one point, the Sears catalog was the second most distributed book in the country. The Bible was the first one. So that's how big these things got. Okay, People would write to Warden Sears and ask questions because people trusted their name. And uh, it became that popular. Okay, And like I said, today they're not used as much. We do most of our stuff online, but you know, if you want a a catalog you, you can still request one so that's another way of getting things out the next gentleman oops went too far the next gentleman is A.T. Stewart A.T. Stewart will build a department store okay so once again the department store well, you know, here's a place where you can go and you can buy many different items. Okay, take a, for example, a Myers and um, a Walmart and things like that. Now, those are discount stores, but the same idea where there's many different things in those stores, a one-stop shop. That's what the department store was is going to be at this time. And they're going to be palaces. They're going to be huge stores, many different floors. And George, James Bogatus will take it even further, and he'll improve these department stores by using steel girder construction so that all the weight on those will be on the steel girders and not the actual wall so they can build them higher. Um, and then this is also possible. You can't have these buildings, these buyer palaces, with, with 10 different floors. Who's going to want to walk up the steps for 10 floors? So what else do you need? The elevator. Oh, I don't have it. I thought it was on there. James Otis, or I'm sorry, Elijah Otis, O T I S, invented the elevator. So this is going to improve things. So now you can go up to these big palaces and you can go up to these stores. And they used to be big. Macy's, really big in uh, New York City. Um, it's still there today. Um, but uh, those things were very important. So. Once again, we're getting things out to the people. Um, improved efficiency. Fred Taylor or Fred T Speedy Taylor. Okay, he will actually study time and motion and take a scientific approach to production. Okay, so he came up with this time and motion to improve production to make things faster and cheaper. And, and that was one of the goals there. Before they, you know... What what's a better way to make something? Is there a better way to a faster way to make these things? And that became very important and still studied today. You see this all the time. Study production and take that scientific approach. And then William Sellers comes around and he standardizes the measuring of nuts and bolts. Okay, before these things weren't the same size and. I mean, those of you that are handy and have worked with tools before, you know, we have a Phillips head and, and a flathead screwdriver. You know, those are still 
upsetting sometimes when you're working on something because there's only two. Imagine if we didn't have a standardized set of those things and all these measurements and it's like working with a, a socket set. You know, if we if if there was no standard whatsoever, things would be even more confusing and, and harder to work on before. But William Sellers puts that into play. And basically, he comes up with the three most important things in economic production. The three most important things in economic production. Are you ready? Here they are. Number one, standardization. Standardiz standardization. That's number one. Number two, specialization. Specialization. And number three, the division of labor. So we have standardization, which is what we just talked about with the nuts and bolts and things like that. Specialization, you know, having people specialize in certain jobs so they can do those jobs in the best manner and go on and make things faster. And then three, division of labor. Have a set division of labor from people that are doing the custodial work to people working on the machines to management and things like that. Those are the three divisions or the three things, most important things in economic production as far as what these gentlemen believe. Okay, that's it for that.